prerequisite time, when you see these things, it's going to be a hint to you, and not to me because we're going to be gone, but to the generation that he's speaking to, there's going to be an observation of something that they can notice to get ready. Amen? And so who is he speaking to? He's talking to the Jews, right? <clears throat> One of the ways you can interpret that also is when he talks about uh, pray that your, your flight will not be on the Sabbath. Well, who observes the Sabbath? The Jews. So that is a further qualification of who he's speaking to. Okay? And so the time element is when you see the, the sun and the moon and all these things happening and there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places and pestilence and all. He says, when you see these things, these are the signs to watch and see, look for. And when they start to happen, there's going to come a time that you're going to have to flee to Judea. So it's a mandate for the people of Israel to be on the alert, to watch for these signs and wonders. So that does not apply to us. Right? I'm not going to get on a plane, buy a ticket to Judea, and fly to Judea. It's not going to happen because he's not talking to us. So there's a particular time element that you've got to be aware of. And there are many biblical words that express natural elements of time, such as times, seasons, Days, nights, weeks, months, years, ages. And some of these words are literal in their meaning. That is, a day equals 24 hours. Now, the author of this book says there's been debates have, have been held to determine whether the days of creation in Genesis 1 are literal 24-hour days or whether the days are symbolic periods of time. You probably heard that. I don't know if you've studied that, but some people say, well... Like the Bible says to, to God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And they say, so creation, it could have been he created the first day, waited thousands of years, created the second day, waited thousands of years, created the third day. But I object to that interpretation because if you read the account in Genesis, <coughs> excuse me, if you read the account in Genesis, you'll see it says, and he created the night, and then he created the day, and then he created the night, and it was the first day. Right? Okay, so the first day was there. So there's a cycle that God created. Day and night. Here's my, here's my answer. If there are a thousand years between, okay, and we have it in a 24-hour cycle, because all of the moons and all of the, the oceans and everything are on a timetable. Everybody knows that, right? Your summer, winter, spring, and fall all on a timetable. So if that's the case, that there was thousands of years between the days, then we're living now in a 24-hour day. My question is, when did it change? When did it change from thousands of years to 24 hours? It's continuing, and then it says he made the second day, then the third day, then the fourth day, then the fifth day, the sixth day, the seventh day was the, was the Sabbath. And God rested on that day. So I don't see it that as, if, if it was thousand, it should still continue to be on. What changed? How did it change? It's still 24 hours in a day. So I, I believe taking that scripture out of, I think it's in Peter, where it says, uh, or I think it's in Peter, but I'm not sure. It says a year to the Lord is like a thousand years, and a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. It's taken that out of context. So I believe that they are the same as it was today, the same as it is today. It was night and day. Then he made the second day. Then he made the third night. Then he made the, you follow me, the second night. Then he made the third day. Then he made the third night, and so forth and so on. Sometimes... You'll see in Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, each week rep represented seven years, so that the total time of the prophecy was 490 years. And you'll find that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 20 to 27. That should be in your book. Sometimes these words are used in a more symbolic sense. Okay? Note the phrases that simply use the word day to refer to a season of time as opposed to a literal day. 
So you have to understand the difference when you're reading something in a day or when you're reading something in the Bible that has the word day. Make sure you take it in context. Like, for example, the Bible talks about in 2 Samuel 22, 19 and Psalm 18, 8. They're probably in your, in your book. The day of calamity. The day of calamity, though it's, it's, it says day, singular, it means a period of time. It doesn't mean a literal 24-hour period. The day of your fast. The day or time of trouble. That's in Job, Psalms. The day of adversity. The day of affliction. The day of doom. The day of trial. Hebrews uh, 3.8 says this. Maybe you could put this on the board, Pastor Tom. Do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, as in the day of your of trial. Hebrews 3 8. I'll wait for him to put that up so you can see it. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation. Do the NLT for me. When they tested me in the wilderness, the, uh, don't hide in your heart as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. That's the one, right? I, I get a little bit different here. Maybe, might be a different translation. It says, in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me through, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation. But it says day of trial. It wasn't just one day. It was a period of time. So you've got to read it and make sure that you understand that it's not a day as, uh, as far as 24 hours, but it's a, it's a period of time. <clears throat> In this passage, the day of trial was about 40 years in Hebrews. That was a 40-year trial. Remember they were 40 years? But yet it says the day of trial, so we understand that that is that period of time. In Proverbs 6.34 is the day of vengeance, the day of punishment, the day of rebuke, <clears throat> the day of grief and desperate sorrow, the day of distress, the day of salvation, the day of prosperity. Other words associated with the passing of time are used in much the same way. <clears throat> in Ezekiel 45.14, it says there was an appointed season. Amen. Just like your farmer, there's a certain season that your farmer will plant the seed, right? And then there's a certain time or season or period of time that that seed has to germinate, right? And then it has to grow. So at, when it first starts to grow, you don't go down and harvest it. You've got to wait for the fullness of the harvest of that thing. So there's a period of time called harvest. You follow what I'm saying? So all you have to do is make sure that when you're interpreting the scriptures, make sure you're in the right time element. Uh, one of the scriptures that comes to my heart and mind right now, um, which shows the urgency or the eminence of Christ's return, that it's eminent. Christ is going to return. So he says, behold, now is the day of salvation. So that's why people shouldn't put it off. See, we always give people time. We all say, we gotta, you know, we've got to give them time. They may not have time. That boy today didn't have time. Although he was a Christian, he was saved. So, But, I mean, just think for a moment if he wasn't saved. Think of those that are in a car accident, and boom, they're gone. That's why he says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You can't put off tomorrow. You don't know if you have tomorrow. And see, when we understand the urgency of the day or the time in which you live, you and I will live differently. When you understand the times and the seasons that we're living in now, you will act differently, you'll speak differently, you'll be committed to Christ. Come on. Okay. You won't be wishy-washy. You won't be lukewarm. You'll be committed. Because why? 
Because you understand, and when I say understand, it doesn't mean that you have a head knowledge. People have tremendous head knowledge, okay, and many of them are not even saved. Not a head knowledge, but you understand the time in which you are living. And how, we, how you know that you understand the time that you're living is that you have chosen and made the decision to live right. But see, today in, in Americanized Christianity, we, had, we don't take the process of time because we always say, and how many of us said this? I'll do it tomorrow. Right? Or I've got plenty of time. Do we? Well, you need to know the time in which you live in. Amen? There's appointed seasons, there's a time of trouble, there's a time of singing, there's a time of punishment, there's a time of promise, there's a time of healing. All of these things you have to take into consideration when you're interpreting the scriptures. You know, we sing that song, For I know my Redeemer lives. Okay? And we take that word no. Do you know what that word no means? It's not a... It's not just a knowledge of knowing that your Redeemer lives. It's a, it's a knowledge according to experience. It's a, it's a knowledge according to intimacy. That when you know, you, have, you know what's happening. You know your Redeemer lives. So therefore, like Paul says, he knew of the intimacy and the knowledge that he has. So he says, for I know, and I am persuaded. And he says, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me. He knew the, the times in which he lived, he knew what he had to do. And so the commitment level is measured by the person understanding the period of time in which we're living in. And if Christians really understood that, they'd be living a whole different way. Amen? They'd be living holy, righteous. They would serve the Lord with fear and trembling. That's missing today. That's missing today. Think about it. <clears throat> There's a book that I have, um, just to divert for a moment. There's a book that I have called The Gospel Worship. It's written between the 1600s and 1700s by Jeremiah Burroughs. And if you can go online, I think it might be out of print, though. But if you get that book and you begin to read that book, that book will put you on your face. He talks about what real worship is. And uh, he uses the scripture, I think it's in Leviticus chapter 10, where he says, the Lord is speaking to Aaron, and he says, I will be sanctified in them that worship me. That you cannot worship God unless you're willing to be sanctified. Unless you're, you're willing to allow the fire of the Holy Spirit To permeate you, to burn out the things that are not right in you, you know, you know, and I don't know why I'm I'm kind of getting off a little bit, but I need to do this. Today, everybody wants to soak. You, you ever see that? Everybody's soaking, bathing, soaking. I tell I, people say I'm soaking in the presence of God. This is another word they use. I forget what it was, but but it's a, I think it's soaking. It's soaking. You know, if you really got to soak that bad, take a bath. Okay? You know, and they just, they just sit there, and they, they close their eyes, and, you know, they're just soaking. But my Bible says that you may come with confidence before the throne of grace, not to soak. You don't go into God's presence to soak. You go there to obtain grace and mercy in time of need. There's a purpose why we get into the presence of God. It's not for the goosebumps and ducky bites that we get. It's not so that we feel good. And I don't know why I'm going. Maybe I'm going off on this for somebody on, on. We don't do that for that purpose. You know, we don't soak. We're soaking a presence. We're soaking a we don't want to soak up presence. We want to seek a person. 
We want God. And when God shows up, his, his presence is there. And when God shows up, he is light. He dwells in unapproachable light, the Bible says. And therefore, because he is light and we have a darkness in us, that light will expose the darkness. You ain't going to be soaking. You might be sulking. <laughs> Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Imagine that when Isaiah saw him. Oh, shalabahatakai or robo. Isaiah saw him high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. His glory filled the temple. He didn't soak. He said, woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips. And then he said this. And I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. Oh, to get a grip of that. Oh, okay, so I'm done. I'll get off my soapbox. Okay. Acts 1, verse 6 and 7 says, Therefore, Acts 1, verse 6 and 7, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times, or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, they wanted Jesus to tell them, to tell them the future. Now, there are certain things that God has decreed in the prophetic realm and has written things for the future, which is Revelation, Daniel and Ezekiel, and other scriptures of prophecy. But that was God's initiation. We don't go to God and say, tell me the, the Powerball number, please. No, we don't go to God with those things. So they were asking him, you know, tell us what time. He says, no, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. He wasn't telling them that they're not going to know certain things that would happen. He says, no, you are not going to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, it's God's choice whether to reveal that or not. It's in his authority not in yours. Sometimes we're asking God and taking authority that God has not given us. These are all important things of interpreting the Bible. Okay? Make sure you interpret it correctly. You know? Don't take things out of context. Don't read in one part of the Bible, Judas went out and hung himself. Turn the page. Go thou and do likewise. Really, some people do do that. It's called uh, Russian roulette Bible reading. They read one scripture, throw it out, pulls it out. Oh, no, don't do that. He says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night but when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Now, <clears throat> I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, mostly all the women here except my wife was pregnant. My wife has spiritual babies. Right? But every woman here has gone through pregnancy, right? Those pains, do they all come out all at once? Or they come gradually, right? And they intensify, don't they? Huh? <laughs> okay, they start out small. Oh, I got a pain. Oh, 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 oh. And then it's like, ah! <laughs> right? You get the intensity of the pain. What that's saying is, is that there's going to be an intensity that is going to grow and grow and grow and grow. So again, make sure when you read the scriptures that you know the time element. Sometimes these words suggest spirit. Uh, spiritual and prophetic aspects of time. Now note the phrases that simply use the word day, the word day <clears throat> but it refers to aspects of time. Okay, And uh, just remember, we're going to pray for Jen because she's leaving for vacation after the service. Okay, in, in Isaiah and Joel and 1 Thessalonians, it says the day of the Lord. How many ever remember reading about the day of the Lord? It's not just a 24-hour period. Okay, there's an, appointed there's an appointed day in Hosea 9.5. The last days, the day of his manifestation. There's the day of the Lord's sacrifice. 
the day of his wrath. Sometimes I wonder if we really, really were able to handle to see just the glimpse of when that day would be. We'd be in awe. Say, Pastor, what's going to happen? Read Revelation 16. Read Revelation 14, 15, 16. When God, when Jesus opens up the scrolls and the wrath of God is poured out upon this earth such as never has the earth ever seen in all of its history, the things that are going to happen on this earth, that should, see these truths that when you read the Bible, these truths should motivate you to share your faith with the unsaved. I believe there's a purpose for the church, and it's not for conferences, although conferences are nice, okay? But the purpose of the church isn't just to come and sit in a chair and listen to a sermon and go home and live your life and then come back on Wednesday and listen to a message and go home and, and come on Monday night for prayer and then go home and just keep all of this to yourself. I believe the purpose of the church is to see the relevance of, of what we're teaching to you and take that relevance and apply it to your life and then see the urgency of the time in which we live that will motivate you. How many have unsaved friends? Right? Do you tell them about Jesus? Do you mention Jesus to them? Do they, oh, let me say this. Do they see Jesus in you? Without a word. All of these things are important. The day of his fierce anger, the day of judgment, the day of redemption. You have all of the um, references, I believe, in your, in your book. The day of his coming. Anybody know the day of the Lord's coming? Anybody know the day that when the Lord's going to come? Well, let me ask you a question. Could he come today? Are you sure? Well, if you know he's coming today, then don't live like you have a tomorrow. If you know he's coming today, don't live like you have a tomorrow. If you really believe that he's coming today, don't, don't believe like you have another day tomorrow. Be diligent, for your adversary seeks whom he may devour. He'll devour your time. He'll devour your energy. He'll devour your devotions. He'll devour your Bible reading. Anything that he can get you to do to keep busy and stay away from the Lord. You heard Pastor Sunday morning, right? What, am I, what is the Lord saying to this church? Come to me in the fire. Come to me in the fire. In the trial that you're going through, come to me and watch how I'll deliver you and tear those ropes off of you and that bondage off of you. But come unto me. Not church, not Wednesday, not Sunday. Those are good things. We have to come to church. We have to hear the word of God. Those are good things. But come to him. When you come into the door, instead of, you know, just talking about frivolous things. Come in the door expecting to meet your God. Come, into the door, come in the doors and come down to the altar and meet with God. Come on, somebody. When you come in, don't come in with all the junk that's going to weigh you down. Don't come in because you just had a fight with your husband or your wife on the way here. And don't come in with that burden. Leave it. Come in and say, I'm here to worship you, Lord. I'm here to praise your name. And as you do, you watch, the burden will lift and the, the problems will lift. Amen. You'll still have the problem when you leave, but you'll handle it different. When you come in the presence of God, you always handle things different. I remember um, Dr. Howard Ryan, how he used to solve problems in churches. When he'd go into a church where there was a split and there was division and there was 
hatred and bitterness and anger. And the board, the board, I'm talking about with the board, and the board would, would be fighting with each other and, and, and just awful. He would set up the first board meeting and he'd walk into that board meeting and he'd call the secretary in and she would come in with communion and place the communion down on the table. And they would serve communion. And one, of the, one time he was telling us a story and he said one of the elders leaned over to him and said, Pastor, you disarmed us. Because you can't partake unworthily. See, this stuff's real. Praise the Lord. No, other words associated with the passing of time are used in much the same way, and it's very important in your interpreting the Bible. Um, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. You can put that up there, Pastor. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Who knows what this scripture means? Yeah, I got one. Okay. If you know what it means, raise your hand. If you don't know, it's okay. I got one, one, one hand raised. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Anyone else know what that is? Okay, let's take a survey. Jen, do you, uh, Jennifer, do you, Je Jeanette, do you know what, what it means? And if you don't, it's okay. It, it, this is not a test. Okay, Je Jennifer, do you know? Jen? Okay. Rebecca? Not sure? Okay, I know Linda knows. She's got that look. I know Annie knows. I know Mama doesn't know. Okay, what about you, Nelson? Do you know? Tribulation time, that's good. Getting closer to the truth. Vicki, not sure? Okay. How about you? Leisha. Okay, Bob, you Lewis, you know, right? Darren, do you know? You, you got a feeling or do you have a no? Okay, something to do with the last days? Bobby? Pastor Tom? Okay. The clue is this. The time. Okay, it says the time of who? Jacob's trouble. So it names the person who's going to be in trouble, right? Okay. When you call out your son's name, right? Aiden? Okay. Cason ain't going to come responding. Okay. Because Aiden's in trouble. <laughs> I'm just using that as an example. So it's a time of Jacob's trouble. Who was Jacob? Jacob was Israel, right? His name was changed. But notice something. He didn't say it was a time of Israel's trouble. Because any time God is dealing with Israel and they're being bad, okay, he goes back to what they were because they're doing the same things that they were. A deceiver, that's what Jacob means, deceiver, supplanter, hello, liar. And he's reminding them, because you went back to the way you were, you're going to go through a time that's so great that none is like it. And so even the time of Jacob's trouble or the time of Israel's trouble, but he shall be, who's he? Who's he? Remember what I tell you? Read it in the context. Who are we talking about? Whose trouble? Jacob's trouble. 
But who's going to go through the trouble? Huh? Jacob, Israel, right? He's going to go through that trouble. The nation is just going to go. But who's he? Jacob, Israel. He shall be saved out of it, right? If you're going through trouble, you don't want your neighbor to be delivered. You want to be delivered. He shall be saved. Israel shall be saved out of it. Now, here's where people go off. They get into spiritualization. Or they get into the uh, uh, allegorical method of interpretation. Well, Jacob is a sign of, he, it's, it's kind of like the church. And so it's a time of the church's trouble, and the church will be saved out of it. No. Remember? Specific time, specific place, dispensation, specific person. He's talking about Israel. He's not talking about the church. It does damage to the interpretation when you insert something that's called eisegetics. You're putting eisegetically, you're putting the meaning in rather than taking the meaning out. Exegesis rather than eisegesis. Eisegesis is putting the meaning in. Exegesis is taking the meaning out. You always want to take the meaning out and not put the meaning in. Amen? Okay. So we understand that that's the time. The times of the Gentiles. Look at Ezekiel 30, verse 3. I don't know if I'll get through all of this, but if I don't, you have your books you can read, right? How many are reading your books? I got one, two, three. Anybody else reading the books? Raise your hand. I want to see if you're reading the books. You're not reading the books. Why do you have the book? You got to read the book. You got to study the book. This is Bible study, right? You should be reading the book. You should be reading the scriptures, looking up the scriptures. I know Jeanette does. She's she's a, a real adamant student. She goes there and she reads that book. I know you do. Right. Well, you should. Right, you should look at the scriptures and take your time. You, no one says you're in a hurry. You don't have to finish this by, uh, by this year. You'd be surprised. You do a little, a, little, a little here, a little there. Before you know it, boom. You know? It's like uh, when, uh, when Nelson started building those shelves in his cellar, right? It started with one piece of wood, right? And he didn't finish it all in one day. He did a little bit here and a little bit there and... You know, one day he would may skip it, or if it was raining or something, then he'd go down again and do a little bit here and a little bit there. And, and over a period of time, it's done. And if I ever need shells built, if you ever want shells built, that's the man to call right there. I'm serious. You had a seller. If you want some, I'm talking, you have to pay him a little bit, though, you know? Okay, see, so get you a little income on the side. Praise the Lord. So we have a time of harvest. You have a, Well, let me go back. Time of Gentiles. Ezekiel 30, verse 3. For the day is near. Uh-oh. Now, this was written, what, hundreds, hundreds uh, a couple of thousand years, 3,000 maybe years, 4,000 years ago. For the day is near. There was, he was given a warning. The day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. Listen to this. The day of the Lord is near. Oh, boy, Jesus is coming. It's going to be a sunshine day. Is it going to be a sunshine day? No, a cloudy day. How do you know it's going to be a cloudy day? Because he says he's coming in the clouds. <laughs> See, we already know the weather prediction. <laughs> it's going to be cloudy. <laughs> because <laughs> he's coming in the clouds. It's a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. Uh-oh. What's the heathen? Really bad people? No, the Gentile nation. That's what heathens were. 
Amen. We got the, and even look at Luke 21, 24. See, I don't know if I'm going to finish, but I'll try. Luke 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. In other words, Jerusalem is going to be trodden down by the Gentiles. In other words, they're going to have Gentile rule in Jerusalem until the times, say it with me, times, of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, there's twofold prophetic utterance for the scripture. One is still futuristic, but even at the point of time. Do you know when this began to happen? Listen, read it again. Then captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Do you know when that was? Gentiles had rule in Jerusalem in 1948, up until that time. And that's the time that Jerusalem was taken by the Israelites and the Jews and was no longer under Gentile rule. But now there's also Palestinians in rule in Jerusalem. There's big, you know, the mosque and all that stuff. So there's a futuristic promise to this. Until the Gentiles be fulfilled. I believe, in my heart, this is me now. I believe when, and I don't even believe he even knows what he's doing. But when Trump made the declaration, we're moving our embassy and the capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. That is the beginning. Mm. Come on. That's the beginning of something prophetic. So we have a time of harvest. Oh, let me go back. The time of latter rain, Zechariah 10.1. Put Zechariah 10.1 up there for me. Who wants to be a sweetheart? Give me some more water. Is my cup, my, lift my cup, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Look at this. Ask ye the Lord, rain. Hear me now, look. The Bible says you have not because you, uh-huh. He says, ask ye of the Lord, rain in the time of the latter. Wait a minute, hold up. Wait, let's read that again. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. It's already raining. And he says, ask for more. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. Now that's talking about a literal harvest time. In harvest time, there was the former rain and the latter rain. Now, we can take that on a spiritual application. The former rain is Acts chapter 1. And, I, and he pours out his spirit upon all flesh, right? And they began to speak in other tongues, and they were all baptized in the Holy Ghost, right? That's the latter rain for us. But he says, ask for rain in the time of the latter rain. Lord, we want a Holy Ghost book of Acts move of your Holy Ghost. One more time, Lord. One more time. Give it to us one more time, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm excited. I'm sorry. Woo. Then there's a time of harvest, Matthew 1330. There's a time of reformation, the times of restoration. There's the time of the end, the time of the end of the ages. The time of the dead in Revelation eleven eighteen. Part of the challenge of interpreting is to determine whether the use of these time-related words is to be literal, symbolic, 
are prophetic. Remember that. Some things were literal, some were symbolic, or prophetic. Most of the time, the content of the passage will help you to decide the correct interpretation. So read the scriptures before and the scriptures after. Someone gave me a question uh, about a, maybe four or five days ago. I was talking to somebody. They asked me a question about a scripture. And they said, I, I just want to give you this to think about. It had to do with eschatology. And uh, I said, okay. And they said, I want you to give me your interpretation of it. So I started working on it today, and I got excited. You know, and I'm just digging it out and digging it out and digging back to the root Greek words. And See, I like that stuff. Getting back into it and seeing the proper tense and, and the mood and all of that stuff and, and how, it, how it equates and all that. So I'm getting this uh, paper together to give them, and then I want them to give me their their meaning of that scripture. He gave it me partially, but I want to see where he gets me the information from. And, and, you know, sometimes people have an inclination or they get something in, in, in their subjective spirit, subjectively, and they think that that's the true meaning. But always remember this. Like, you hear people all the time, um, uh, even on Facebook, you see, like, uh, this, the, uh, Pastor Ron Sutton, he's, he cracks me up. He's talking about this um, soaking now and going... And what these people are doing, these, these leaders are doing, Christian ministers, is they're going to, to the graveyards of these dead uh, evangelists and pastors and men of God and women of God, and they're laying on their, gra they're laying on their, on their grave site to receive a greater anointing. Now, how they do that, well, that's necromancy, by the way. Okay. Well, the reason why they do that, and they use a biblical uh, reference to that, is when Elisha was thrown into the grave and they threw a dead man in there, the anointing was still on him even though he was dead. So they, they grab that and they see, see they, they say God, God is, is showing them that they need to do that, to go there to get the anointing. Let me tell you something. My anointing comes from God, not a dead person. Hallelujah. But see how you can take the scripture out of context. Yes. Yeah, but that's, that's just a Photoshop thing. He wasn't sucking on bones. No, he didn't take a shovel and dig it up. That's just, that was just, but the, but the content is there, that he went to Amy McPherson's gravesite to receive the anointing, and Catherine Kuhlman, too. Yeah. Okay, you don't need that. See, that's where people get off, all the gold dust, you know, all the feathers coming down and all that baloney. That's all demonic stuff or man-made stuff. And if it's man-made stuff, it's because they're doing it to deceive people. Okay. But they take Scripture out of context. And you can make this thing say anything you want and build big churches. So anyway, where were we? Okay, uh, let me see. Give me five more minutes. I'll, I'll just try to finish up this one part here. What are the dispensations of time that are relevant to the biblical interpretation? And there are a couple of different ways that you and I can look at the dispensations of time. And the word dispensation means an administrative system or management. That's all it means. When this word is applied to God's interaction with man, it has to do with the ordered way in which God has intended with man through human history. How many know that God's a God of order? He doesn't just throw things around and, and do, does things without meaning or purpose. He has an order about him. The Bible says when we are in the church, he says, let everything be done decently and in order. There's an order. Part of that order is getting on time, getting here on time. Amen? Praise God. These dispensations cannot be fully understood without understanding of God's eternal purpose. All the dispensations are a gradual outworking of that purpose among mankind. 
Okay, let's look at God's intention with man can be seen from a purely chronological point of view. Biblical chronological ages include the following, the eternal past, the age of creation, the pre-flood or antediluvian age. I'm just going to read these off. The age of the patriarchs, you, you know who they are, right? The age of the law, time of Moses. The messianic age, time of Christ. Let me just go quickly on these here. How does the interpreter use the chronological principle in biblical interpretation? Well, the interpreter should determine the following in order to make proper application of the passage in question. Determine whether or not the passage has a time element ascribed to it. Always remember that. Like the fleet of Judea. Right? People can open up the Bible and say, well, it's in the Bible, fleet of Judea. Let's go. Get up plane tickets and go. No, there's a time element to that. It's the end times. Okay. Does the passage certain uh, does the passage contain any of the key words that are associated with the element of time? And what we talked about the different times we talked about that. Determine whether the time element used is to be interpreted literally, symbolically, or prophetically. Determine the dispensation that relates specifically to the passage under consideration. I'm going to give you these, okay? It should be in your book. I'm going to give you the dispensation, and then I'm going to give you the related covenant. Dispensation of innocence is the Edenic covenant in Eden, when God made the covenant with Adam and Eve. The dispensation of conscience is the Adamic covenant, when God made a covenant with Adam. The dispensation of human government, that was when God established the Noahic covenant with Noah. Amen. He told him, from now on, I'm not going to destroy the earth. I'm going to put a bow in the heavens, and that will be the sign of my covenant. Dispensation of promise, that was the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? Dispensation of the law, that was the Mosaic covenant, when God made a covenant with Moses. The dispensation of grace, that's the new covenant. That's the covenant you and I enjoy. And the dispensation of the kingdom, that's the everlasting covenant. Also recognize that there are different rules that apply to different dispensations. You cannot necessarily take the rules from one dispensation and automatically apply them to another dispensation. And I believe that's where a lot of people get, get off because they, they try to interpret something from another dispensation. <clears throat> like, uh, well, you know what? We, sh we should go back to killing animals for, for, our, for our sins, you know? Or uh, like the Israelites, when they do that, when they build the temple, they're going to go back to animal sacrifice. Or oh, they're going to build the ark. See, we have to be careful. Let me, let me just say this, okay? With all due respect, understand what I'm saying. Okay? When they bring the ark of the covenant back into the temple, God's presence is not going to be on it. But everybody gets all excited. Oh, the Jews, you know, they're going to bring the temple back and they're going to bring the ark of the covenant. We're so, we want to see the ark of the covenant. You ain't going to see the ark of the covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is going to go into the Holy of Holies. <laughs> okay. But they're going to, see, they're going to try to pump it up. God is not going to be on that. The Bible says that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He did in the times past. Well, let me ask you this question. Why isn't he going to dwell in temples made with hands. I want to get that heat off. Why isn't he going to? Come on, somebody. Why isn't he going to dwell in temples made with hands? Yes, Bob. Yes. Read Ephesians. We're the temple of God. We're the lively stones fitly framed together. Hallelujah. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands because now he dwells in us. Hallelujah. Think about that. 
That's why we all gather together with all of the gifts and all of the things that God gives us, and we make up the body, every, every piece fitly framed together, ministering one to another. All of us together make up that body of that temple. But ye, plural, are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are ye, all of you together, not just one single person. All of us together make up that temple. Amen? That's great. All right, I'll end with that. Okay? So that way we can, uh, we can uh, finish. It's almost 8.30 already. Let me, huh? Yep, we're going to pray for Jen. Amen. So I believe we've got maybe four or five more lessons on this. <coughs> um, June 13th and June 20th, two Wednesday nights, um, Brother Jim Moffat's going to be with us. Yeah. He's going to come. I think he's going to be talk, talking on uh, the covenants. June 30th. Uh, June 13th, I'm sorry. June 13th and June 20th. Those are the two Wednesday nights consecutively. June 13th and the 30th. Uh, 13th and the 20th. <laughs> Amen? Are you getting something out of this? I hope you're really learning how to interpret this word because there's going to come a lot more crazy stuff down the pike. Okay? And you've got to be careful because not all of it's going to be God. And you've got to know this word. Okay? And not only know it up here, but know it in here. Because the way that I measure something, it's not measured by how many degrees you have or if you have a master's or a doctorate. How you measure when somebody knows something is that they've experienced it, and they're living it. That's when you know something. It's not just about having it up here, having it here and walking it out. Amen? Come on up here so we can pray for you. Hallelujah. When we have some ladies come up and lay hands on them. Mama, just stretch your hand to her. <clears throat> Father, we thank you and praise you for these times that we seek you, Lord. And Father, I pray for Jen for traveling mercies, God. Lord, you know all of her life and all the things that she goes through and feels and aggravations and frustrations and so, Lord, vacation time is a time to just step aside and just step back. And so, Father, as she goes to Florida to visit with her mom and dad and, and Alex and Haley, we pray, Father, for your divine protection. Father, we ask that you would send your holy angels before them, behind them, to the left of them, and to the right of them. Protect them, Father, as they travel down and help them help her, Lord, to hear your spirit when, she, when you say stop and rest, that they'll stop and rest. Let them arrive at their destination safely. Father, while they're in Florida as they travel, give them traveling mercies while they're in Florida, going back and forth to different places. And Father, when they return back, Father, Give them traveling mercies back home. Surround them with your presence. Lord, let her know that you're with her. Keep them safe from all harm and danger. Father, we bind every aggressive driver against them in the name of Jesus. And we plead the blood of Jesus from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet and the kids. Protect them, Father from all danger, and return them safely to us. We thank you and we praise you for your mighty power, your mighty blessing, and help her, Lord. Lord, keep her. When the enemy tries to raise its ugly head with any disagreements, 
Let it be peaceful. Let it have an overabundance of awareness that you're sitting right there beside her. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. God bless.